This is Ken Gosnell with CEO Experience, and today at our CEO Conversation, we're honored to welcome Joel Trammell. Joel is a startup CEO, um, author of the book, The CEO Tightrope, um, is, has expertise in growing and scaling uh, software companies, and has uh, sold uh, companies and restarted different companies. And so he really has great insight on how to manage growth for a company and organization and then also how to really have that vision of what the future looks like for that company. So Joel, welcome. Thanks for being here with us today. Great to be with you, Ken. Well, Joe, I love your book, uh, The CEO Tightrope. I, I have my copy here, the uh, autographed version of it. And, you know, in that book, I mean, and we can spend some time talking about lots of different aspects of it, but, you know, one of the things that you outline is three components of good leadership. And, you know, obviously that's important for every CEO to, to talk about. You talk about, you know, credibility is one component, and then you go on the list of the other. Can you outline how you define good leadership and why it's important for CEOs to understand leadership? Yeah, I think leadership's one of those words that somehow, uh, you know, people use it so often that, that they don't stop and think about what it really means. And it gets very amorphous to people. And so, you know, I, I have an engineering background, so I have to define things and be very specific with stuff before I can wrap my small mind around it. And so, you know, I love Eisenhower's quote, which uh, he's famous. He said, leadership's the art of getting someone else to do something you want done because he wants to do it. And so, uh, uh, you know, that, that's a concept I really like. And so how do, you, how do you have influence with people? How do you get people to do what you want them to do? And, and again, make them think it's their idea, uh, which is different than management, where you get to make a bunch of decisions because of your position. You know, you get to decide things. And, and so it's really, both are important, but uh, the leadership side, I think, isn't well understood. So in, in the CEO role, people naturally want to follow you. And so it's not like you're just meeting somebody on the street and you have to establish some sort of relationship. People would like to follow the leader of their organization. Mm. And so it, it, it's a little simpler job uh, for the CEO. And I've identified three things that if the CEO focuses on those three things, I call them the three C's, uh, credibility, competence, and caring. And if you focus on those three things, people will want to follow you and want to be led by you. And so the first one, credibility, uh, it's pretty simple. When you say something, do people believe you're telling them the truth as you understand it? Uh, obviously, sometimes we make mistakes. We say things that we think are true that aren't, but, but all they care about is, is do you have an authenticity and a transparency about you? And, and those are the words you really want as CEO. You want your people to describe you as authentic and transparent. Do you tell them everything that they should reasonably expect to know about the business and the organization. And then the second one that you kind of pair with that is competence. You can be the most honest person in the world, uh, but if you're not competent in the job, if you're Colonel Clink and the inmates get out of the prison yeah. camp every night and run a mission, uh, I see there's some gray right. hairs in the audience, so they'll understand the Colonel Clink Absolutely. analogy there. Uh, but uh, you know, if you're not competent at your job, now that's not near as high a standard as credibility, uh, credibility, you, you know, you can tell people a, a fib once and get away with it. And after that, they, they pretty much won't trust you. Right. Uh, competence, you just have to be solid at what you do, but you can't present plans and tell everybody things going to be great. And next year, we're going to do 50 million and then you do 10 million next year. Uh, you, you know, often I see CEOs struggle with that. And then, and then the third one, and, and I deal with a lot of technology CEOs. So, so this is one that they, they particularly struggle with. The third one's caring. Uh, do people believe that you actually care about them uh, and their success uh, as much as you care about your own? And, you know, it's not a, you know, the old days we romanticized the captain was supposed to go down with the ship. I don't think people expect the captain to go down with the ship anymore. But I think they do think that, that the captain should be concerned with the crew. The crew eats first. Uh, do I really love the crew? Uh, and, and those are the kind of things that show caring. And, and a lot of people care deeply, but if you sit in your office all day and they have to put pizza under the door and you never talk to anybody, people aren't going to perceive that you care. And so one of the key things with all three of these is it's in the perception of the person being led. 
Mm. Okay. It, it, you can be the most honest person in the world, but if the people you're trying to lead don't perceive you as being honest, it does no good. And, and, and caring is very much that way. People have to perceive you care. And so for some of us, like I said, I was an engineer. My natural tendency was numbers and things and not dealing with people. And I had to learn techniques to show people I cared. I had to focus on remembering people's names and their spouses' names and their kids' names. And like before every Christmas party, when I was running one of our organizations, I had a set of cue cards and I went through everybody's spouse's name for a week or two before the Christmas party. So I could call them by name because they knew me by name. And so I thought, you know, the least I should do is be able to learn their name. And so it's, it's this perception thing you can be honest, you can be caring, but people have to perceive it. But if they perceive those three things, then you will have influence with them and they will want to follow you as a leader. Well, what a great, uh, I think that's the best idea that I'm uh, taking note of here, making cue cards for your employees and uh, specific remembering their names, names of their family, important dates that are really critical to them. You know, I love those three C's, Joe. I think that you articulate and you do it in the book so well. You know, it's easy to remember. It's something that really is a challenge for every leader because we haven't mastered all three of those C's. You know, I talk about credibility uh, in my book. I use the phrase, um, know your yeses and no's, right? And understand how to know what we are committing to and, and what we shouldn't commit to. Uh, you know, I was thinking about, and I'm, I, I just wanted to have a real honest conversation around that second C, that competence piece. I know so many CEOs and leaders, and you referenced the caring piece where you struggled with that as an engineer, but what does a leader do when they don't feel competent? There's so many areas to lead in a business that, you know, we can't do everything well. So how do you encourage leaders to improve their competence? Well, for, first off, I'd say the most important words for a CEO, maybe in the, in the whole English language, uh, is I don't know. Mm. Uh, admitting what you do know and what you don't know. And, and I see a lot of CEOs I work with that, you know, they get put in a meeting and some employee asks a question and they're just not willing to say, I don't know. <laughs> and, they make, and they come up with some answer uh, that, that, you know, eventually somebody figures out that really doesn't make a lot of sense. And you just kind of bleed away, away competency. Uh, and it's also the, on competency, it's often confused with optimism uh, as well. I mean, yes, we want our leaders to be optimistic, uh, but there's, there, there has to be a realistic component to it, too. I mean, I'll have, uh, you know, a startup CEO come in and say, oh, yeah, well, you know, we're going to do one million in the first year. We're going to do 10 million in the second year. We're going to do 50 million in the third year. And I go, y you know how long it took Microsoft to get to 50 million in revenue? arguably the most successful company in the history of software, it took them eight years to get to 50 million in revenue. You're probably not going to get to 50 million in revenue in the third year, but if you put that plan out to your team and then the third year you do 5 million, which is probably a great number for most companies, uh, you're going to still appear, you're going to appear incompetent. And so, you know, talking about things and, and, and making statements about things that you don't have control over, uh, is, is where a lot of CEOs get into trouble in the competency thing, making predictions, trying to be optimistic. Everything's going to be great in six months. I don't know if everything's going to be great in six months. I can promise you I'm going to communicate how things are in six months, uh, but I can't promise you everything's going to be great in six months. Well, I think that's powerful. Don't commit to things that we don't have control over. Boy, that's, that's, a, that's, a, <laughs> no, but that's a simple but yet profound real concept for us to embrace as leaders and CEOs, right? That, hey, we are projecting, we can anticipate what we have control over, those things that are beyond our control. We need to be very careful about um, how we communicate that because it does ruin the credibility and the competence of uh, how our team views us. So I think those are excellent pieces of advice. Hey, um, I know one of the areas that I appreciate about you is you've been a startup CEO. You've started multiple companies and grew them to great success. I say right now in the midst of this virus and this kind of shutdown in different places that every one of us needs to be thinking like a startup CEO. Can you give us some insights or some secrets to how to start up well and what does a startup CEO look like? 
Yeah. So, you know, I tell people I, I was a startup CEO because no one would hire me to be CEO of their company. So I had to start my own. I didn't have a choice. It wasn't that I particularly liked startups per se. Uh, but I think the big difference, I, you know, and I've dealt with a lot of uh, people who've worked in larger organizations and often they come to you and they want a job because they think the startup environment's going to be so exciting. And I say the challenge is, you know, in your company, you feel like there are a dozen fences around you. And every time you try to turn and run in one direction, you run into a fence. And I, I, I can see in your eyes, you just want to knock down one of those fences and be able to run in that direction. I said, the problem when you come to a startup, though, is there are no fences. Mm -hmm. So first, you got to figure out which way to run. And, and so that's a, a fundamental difference in the startup. Everything uh, moves the needle in a startup. I mean, if you, if, you, if you have no revenue, hey, we could go put up a lemonade stand. Yes, that will move the needle. Uh, is that the best use of the available resources? And so that's the first thing. The second point I would make about startup is in a startup, you by nature challenge every assumption. And I think that's what businesses these days need to do is challenge every assumption they have made about the business. And it's almost a disadvantage to have 20 years of experience in an industry right now because you know a bunch of things to be true. And, and those things were true three months ago, uh, but a lot of those things may not be true now. And it's really hard to take those things that you've had 20 years of experience going through hard knocks and you absolutely know this is the way this business works. And, uh, and we just had the whole world turned on its head. I mean, uh, you know, I have an executive that worked for me that was at Hertz and now he's, you know, they laid off 80% and, you know, they were the leading rental car company in the United States. I mean, they were number one, everybody, you know, and, and all of a sudden you're out of business basically. Um, and so, you know, you, you want to sit down and just challenge every single assumption in your business, everything you think you know, and just confirm, is that still true today? Uh, because in a lot of cases it's not. Wow. Well, that's great advice. Um, you know, I like Hertz. I'm a big believer in Hertz. Uh, um, I still, uh, I still own some Hertz stock, so I'm waiting for it to come back. I might have to wait 20 or 30 years for it. <laughs> we will see. Right. But, uh, um, but I love that concept of challenging every, uh, what we believe, right? Challenging every component and really those assumptions that we have in business and thinking innovatively and creatively. And that's what Jesus, of course, did when he came. He really was challenging all the Pharisees' assumptions of what they thought they knew. I say Jesus is the greatest innovator of all time. And he's really calling us as business leaders to be innovators, I believe. So I like that concept of, hey, let's look at things differently. Let's see something different. Now, again, you may not want to challenge that or you may not go after every single ball in that capacity, but at least you're kind of moving in that direction. Is there a right, right way to challenge things versus a wrong way to challenge things? Well, I, I, you know, certainly, um, you know, there can be some ethical issues you, you run into, and in especially in this environment, obviously none of us, uh, you know, we, we want everyone to succeed. Uh, business is not a zero sum game. It's, it's a, you know, additive, the pie can grow. Uh, but certainly there are gonna be cases in this where, where companies are gonna fail. Uh, and it's opportunity to uh, consolidate the market and, and, and look for that. So, uh, you know, I, I think, you know, if, if you believe, as I do, that business is a, is a fundamental good, uh, you know, I've always loved, you know, Paul didn't go out on his mission trip and he didn't go set up a tent and say, I'm going to do a revival and everybody come hear me preach the word. He went and started businesses and preached to the people who came in the shop. And so, uh, you know, I, I think if you believe as I do that it's a natural good, then 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 doing business, Im improving at business, being better at business, uh, you know, we need that economic activity because unfortunately a lot of people are really going to be hurting uh, over the next, uh, you know, 12 to 24 months as this continues to ripple through our economy. The church is going to be needed now more than ever. Um, and, and, and we need to be running on all cylinders to be able to have the resources available to help those in need. Real quick, because I know that you um, have been following this um, virus and of course you put it into some software and you've been <laughs> measuring it and looking at the, which sure. I love. <laughs> what is your vision as you look out? Do you have any insights that 
kind of aha moments that you've experienced or what would you encourage us to think about as we look at the next say 24 months in business? Yeah, I think it's going to be unfortunately a long road back. Um, <laughs> I've actually been telling this story and, and uh, I was a Harlem Globetrotters fan as a kid. I, I thought I was going to be six, four and I wanted to play basketball. And, <laughs> and so, uh, you know, loved watching the Harlem Globetrotters and Metal Arc Lemon had this routine he used to do early in the game. After about two or three minutes of play, he, they'd throw him the ball and for no apparent reason, he would call timeout. And he would just stand there with the ball, call timeout. Of course, both teams would head to their benches. And then as the def defense sat down at their bench, he would call time in and go make a layup and, and score. And, of course, the referee would come running over, blow his whistle and say, you can't do that. that doesn't, it doesn't work that way. And Medlark would say, I called timeout. I could call time in. And, uh, you know, that's what I felt like uh, these politicians, the governors and mayors, uh, just fundamentally didn't understand that while they could, at least for a short period of time, call time out, uh, the implications of that, it was more like throwing the rod in the, you know, a, a rod in the center of a machine and thinking that, oh, well, it'll just start right back up and, and get going. And so that's the concern I've had from the beginning is don't do anything you can't restart. And, and that, unfortunately, I think is what has happened. So, uh, you know, now the, the, the American economy is an amazing thing and we'll get through this and we'll get better. But I don't think it's a it's a V-shaped recovery as they want to talk about. I think it's, you know, 12 to 24 months of real struggle as, uh, you know, various industries go away or, or get downsized significantly and, and potentially other industries pop up to fill the void. Yeah, it's interesting. I think this is going to be a defining moment in life of us uh, business leaders and even um, kind of uh, as we look at the economy. And, you know, I think that it speaks to one of the things that I've spent a lot of time thinking about is the whole concept of stewardship, right? And you mentioned the Apostle Paul and, and you know, the reality of stewardship is that we have to do the best that we can with the resources that we have available in that particular moment. Right. And I think that's what the parable of the talents teaches us, right? So exactly the ability to pivot, to change, maybe to have some setbacks. I don't think in that parable, the guy with five bags that he all of a sudden woke up overnight and he had 10 bags. He probably had one day where he had six bags and then maybe he had three bags, you know, and, and that was kind of the way business uh, functions at this point. And so, you know, thinking through stewardship over the next uh, 24 months of, you know, how do I work as diligently as I can ask for God to illuminate my thinking, to find creative and innovative ways, and then, you know, be able to potentially even acquire other businesses that might be going out right, as this, as this time goes forward, maybe, you know, it comes to terms with selling and leaving the business, I mean, whatever it is that God's asked me to do uh, during this time. Hey, listen, um, one of the things I know, you've been excellent at growing your organization and, and selling it um, uh, in the past. Can you give us just a window of how you knew when it was time to sell and, you know, what that process was like for you? Any other recommendations that you have of anybody that's thinking about either acquiring a business or selling a business? Well, I mean, I think, you know, that, that is typically the biggest decision uh, an owner of a business makes is, is what time it is to, to sell a business. Uh, and, uh, you know, first we have to realize all our decisions are made emotionally. Uh, we think of ourselves as this rational Mr. Spock type character that makes all our decisions by the numbers. And, and, and that's not reality. Neuroscience has taught us that that's really not what we do. We, we make an emotional decision, then we use that thin layer of analytical reasoning to justify why our decision was the right one. And so, you know, as I talk to, to owners of businesses, I'm always pushing them on, on you know, what, what do you really want? What do you hope to get out of the sale? Uh, you know, the first, uh, you know, big deal I did, uh, you know, we had venture type investors. Uh, when we raised the first $11 million of the deal, I asked them, hey, what's success here? What am I signing up for? Because if you give me $11 million, uh, I assume you have some outcome you're looking for. And I want to know what that is as the leader of the organization. They said $200 million as the outcome. And I think, uh, you know, that was a back of the envelope calculation of what would get them 10 times their money. Uh, return on the deal. And so, you know, nine years later, we sold the business for $200 million. Now, it's not causal, uh, but 
because I knew what the goal was at the start, you positioned the business in a certain way. If they had said the outcome was $20 million, you'd have built a different business. If you were trying to build a billion dollar business, you'd have had to think about doing some, some different things. Um, and so, you know, I'm a big believer in have the end in mind when you start is, are we building a business to sell? Are we building a business to hand on to the kids? Are we building a business? You know, what's the purpose of the exercise? Uh, because too many people I think don't have that end in mind and, and, and it influences so many decisions. Uh, and selling a business is a long and arduous process, especially if you're not prepared ahead of time for it. You haven't built the business to be sellable. There are a lot of businesses I see that you just look at it, and you, go, you know, you really don't have a sellable business here. You have a job that, that you may do very well and you may generate, you know, a, a good income for yourself or whatever, but you don't really have a business that's sellable. And so I, I think that, you know, starting with the end in mind is a key component uh, of what you're trying to achieve and to be successful in, in achieving it. I think that question you just asked is so powerful, whether it's for um, venture capitalists coming into our business or maybe uh, investors, even from an employee standpoint or even for ourselves. you know, that question, let me repeat it because I, I thought this was the best idea as well. What does success look like here? Right. Yes. What is, if you're coming into our company, what do you see as success as an employee, for example, yep. as a business Absolutely. leader, right? What, what does success look like? And just having that clear articulation of that vision is so critical. And yet we miss that so often uh, as business leaders, don't we? I think so. Hey, um, let's, let's talk about the uh, part of that, that conversation of success led you to chorus where you were uh, figuring out the software package because just as you talked about, how do we know if we're building towards success? How do we build, know if we're getting things done efficiently and effectively? So uh, part of what you do now in your current company is you help CEOs and business owners um, understand what's being done, how it's being done, and whether it's being done effectively. Can you tell us a little bit about the underbelly of that and and why it's so critical about building these processes to make sure that we're getting good work done efficiently and effectively? Yeah, I think the important thing that I realized as I built, you know, a business from, from zero, basically, it was my, my wife and I started the business and ended up, uh, we were 275 employees or something when we sold the business, is there were really kind of three distinct stages the, the business went through for me as the CEO. In the, in the first stage, zero to, you know, let's say 20, 25 employees, I could keep everything in my head. Uh, I knew what everybody was working on. I was the center. I was the, you know, center of the wheel, if you will, uh, of what everybody was doing. Uh, and that worked reasonably well. Uh, then we went through a stage from 25 employees to about 150 employees where if I had tried to maintain that style of management, things would have just imploded. It, it wouldn't have worked. Uh, and so what I had to, because when you're the CEO of a 20-person company, you're not only just the CEO, you're really the VP of sales, the VP of marketing, the CFO. The, uh, you know, my wife was the technical person, so that was covered. But everything else, every other executive in the business, I was basically functioning as that executive. And so what you need to do from 25 to about 100, 150 employees is you need to consciously take off each of those hats and hand it to an expert who's better at that job than you are. And, uh, and that's really key. And, and, and so at 150, you should wake up. And, and at that point, you're really the manager of a group of experts. Mm. And if you don't believe that the sales guy is better than you at sales, then you've got the wrong sales guy. And if you don't believe the marketing person's better at marketing than you are, uh, then, then, and so how do you run a group of experts when by definition, they know more about their particular areas than you do? And so that's where Chorus comes in, is I wanted some systematic way to organize all those people, because we need to all be going in the same direction, even though the sales guy's an expert, I don't just do what the sales guy asked me to do every time because I have to consider how that impacts marketing and finance and shareholders and customers and employees and all these different stakeholders, right? And so I have found that unless you write those kind of things down at 150, 
it just becomes a mess and everybody heads off and, and they're sort of headed in the right direction, uh, but not really. And then, and, and, I mean, one of the stories I tell, I, I do a lot of consulting with executive teams about setting goals and what are your objectives? What are you really trying to achieve? And, and so there was a company here in Austin, had about 300 people. And I go in for this goal setting session with the exec team. And as I get off the elevator, a couple of the execs who knew me, but you know, we weren't best buddies or anything, but they almost accost me as I get off the elevator. And they say, oh, Joel, you know, good to see you. We, we just want to let you know we're very aligned as an executive team. We talk about our goals all the time. I mean, we're really tight. And, and I go, oh, oh, really? Well, you know, why are you bringing me in? Well, you know, we probably haven't done a good enough job as we've grown and hired people. We haven't done a good enough job pushing it down to the organization. But as an executive team, we talk about our goals all the time. So I go, oh, okay. So I'm a little, you know, surprised to hear this because normally I go in and people are really confused. And, and so I, I walk into the meeting there. They, you know, we're in the conference room. There are eight execs sitting around the table. And I I say, normally I'd give you this big introduction as to why goal setting is important and why we need to come together, but you guys talk about it all the time, so let's just get started. And so I walk to the board and I say, what's the number one priority for the quarter? And, and like a chorus, to make a pun here, uh, they go, grow 40%, all eight of them. Huh? And I'm impressed, okay? And, and then I have that startled moment as a consultant where you go, oh my gosh, maybe they're smarter than I am. And this is going to be a short meeting, right? So, so I kind of, I turned to the board, I'm writing kind of slow, grow 40%. And then it hits me. Oh, uh, let me ask a question here, guys. How are we going to measure that grow 40%? Sales guy looks at me like I'm stupid and goes, well, bookings, of course, you know, what else would it be? And the CFO looks at him and he goes, heck, bookings. He says, I need revenue. And the marketing guy looks over at both of them, kind of confused and goes, oh, I thought new customer logos was the most important thing. And so here, you know, they thought they were all aligned. They thought that, but they had never written anything down. They had just talked about it at a high level, like a cheerleader, grow 40%. And their teams were off heading in totally different directions. And, and that's what happens. Once you get, uh, you know, above 20, 25 employees, uh, the game of telephone doesn't work very well. There are just too many interactions to be had for everybody to really get it. And so Chorus, you know, at, at some level just helps you align everyone and make sure we're all rowing in the same direction. It's not terribly complicated rocket science stuff. Uh, but most organizations just don't have the discipline to do that on a regular basis. And they're shocked when they find out people are off doing things that, that aren't really related to the goals and mission of the organization. Well, that's a great story. I think every CEO uh, can relate to it. I'm getting some notes on it already. Um, you know, I say CEOs are a lot like diamonds and, and you just referenced that and that our, our employees are a lot like gems but you know, a diamond has so many different angles and we look at things from multiple dimensions. Whereas a lot of times our employees are focused on one dimension. So just like yes. you're talking about, right? Yes, absolutely. And, and sometimes it's hard for us as a leader because we're looking at all those dimensions and we think everybody's looking at all those dimensions, but they're really not. They're, they're focused on the one thing that we've charged them to. And so right. that's where they're looking at. So bringing something together where we can all of a sudden say, hey, this is how we're doing it. This is the order which we're taking. This is how we're seeing this all work together, but then we can come together to accomplish that great thing as a team. I think that's fantastic. And that's, I, that's why I love what you do specifically and related to your uh, software, which I've seen, I think it's excellent. So I appreciate, appreciate that. Yeah, one, um, of, one of the little techniques I use that I, I used with my executives um, and I had these charts put up on the wall in the office was just the triangle of customers, employees, and shareholders. Mm. And I found that very, because like you say, you get a sales guy in there, all he's thinking about is closing the deal. And I said, if you want to be an executive for me, if you want to work with the executive team, you got to be able to take off that sales hat and put on the, the company hat. Mm. And the company hat is somebody who can balance those needs of customers, employees, and shareholders uh, independent of their role as the sales leader. And, and so that's something we would talk about often when we had big decisions to be made. I'd say, okay, everybody, okay, take off your sales hat, take off your marketing hat. Let's talk about the company hat. How do we balance the needs of employees, customers, and shareholders? And I found that very helpful to get people to think in the right context 
Because like you say, every day they're running 90 miles an hour on chasing every deal they can or, or building the pro great product or whatever. And, but if you train them to do that, they can be very helpful in that conversation. Now, one question I had for you, this is, uh, this is just you and, you and I talking a little bit, but you, know, you talk about that chorus, that team working together in synergy. Where does um, you know, uh, a rugged individualist fit into that? Is it, if they have the belief, obviously they can run with their department, but they see the team as most important, or how have you found and how did, how did you lead those, uh, what I would call trailblazers or mavericks or rugged individualists that didn't, didn't necessarily want to operate as part of the team? Yeah, so the, the key role of the CEO is, is setting the direction. Um, you know, here's where we're going. Uh, how you get there is up to you as the leader of your group or department. And, and I don't want to comment on that unless you fail. Uh, the only time I'm going to comment on that is if you fail to get to the goal we've defined. Then I'm going to say, okay, what happened? Why didn't we get there? But, but that's, that's your job to figure out how we get there. And so, but if I'm, but, but the problem is most organizations aren't clear on the goal. And so then they start complaining about the how somebody's doing the job. Well, how can you complain about that until you know where you're going? <laughs> uh, and, and so that, that's the key with, you know, the, the individualists. I, I think most of us, most high performers are individualists. They feel like they can do their job uh, better. And again, that was my view of the organization. I was not the expert at anything. I managed the experts. And so when I understand that and internalize that, uh, then I want them to do it however they can get there. But I do have the responsibility to define what success is, where we're going. But if I'm clear with that, then they can, you know, they can be as individualistic as they want to some extent. Mm -hmm. You know, I was thinking about that the other day as I was preparing for our interview as well. And, you know, I know faith is such an important part of your life. And I want to ask you about your faith perspective and how that shaped your leadership. But I was thinking about Jesus as a leader if you will, of, um, you know, this, these independents, these disciples that he had. And even then the Apostle Paul comes in and, you know, he comes up with a whole creative new way to look at things where he goes to the Gentiles and he does a lot through his writings in prison. And, uh, you know, it's just that perspective of he had that bigger vision like you're talking about and he was clear on it. But yet he had these individuals that he allowed them to have freedom to kind of go and do what they thought they needed to do in different areas using their gifts and talents and abilities. And I think sometimes as leaders, we get a little bit intimidated or scared. We want everybody to kind of do it like we feel comfortable doing it. Um, and so how do you, tell me about your faith perspective and how, how did you get over? Um, Cause I know you've had robust teams, you've grown your company, you've excelled in many, many different ways. Was your faith a component of that? Were you really, stepped back so your team could step ahead? Yeah, I, you know, I, I certainly, I mean, there's, there's to me no question, um, even from an objective historical sense that, that Jesus has to be positioned as, uh, you know, the, the, the greatest leader. I mean, you, you can't find people who years after their deaths, uh, people that, uh, uh, you know, were willing to die for them, uh, uh, years after they had, they had left the earth. And, uh, you know, so clearly, he, you know, he, he met the three C's perfectly. Um, and so I, I think that's a piece of it. Um, I, I don't know. I, I, I think part of my, uh, I was just born with this enjoyment of being around talented people. Uh, yeah, I think it's just part of my makeup. Uh, you know, if I sit next to somebody on a plane and they tell me they're the best basket weaver in the world, I will have an interesting hour long conversation with that person, even though I don't really care about basket weaving. Because <laughs> um, I, I just find excellence is, in any field is, is enjoyable. And I, and I like surrounding myself with people who I think are, are excellent. And, uh, and, and so it, 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 it was natural for me. I never felt like I was giving things up. I was always hoping to find uh, people who were better, uh, maybe I'm just lazy uh, and don't want to do much work uh, is one way to put it. I, mean, I tell people when we raised money, the first, uh, you know, I'd run businesses with my own money, but when we first raised money, uh, $11 million, uh, that was the great joy was now I could hire people to do things better than I could. And so uh, that's just uh, probably as much inborn to me as, as anything else. 
That's awesome. <laughs> hey, I want to come back and talk about recruiting in just a second, but Doug uh, Hillmuth was uh, had a question back to our earlier conversation about coming out of the virus. So I'll uh, let Doug ask his question. Hey, Mr. Hillmuth, can you ask uh, Joel your question? Joel, when you're restarting, as you say, we're all kind of looking at that, and we're looking at it. I'm in an automotive repair business, and we're kind of looking at a restart too, and we're going, and so the kind of questions you put out there to either your customers or your internal team. I was just curious if you had any direction on that, what kind of questions that might 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 be asked of yourself and or your team and your and your customers. Yeah, I mean again it to me it's it's re-examining our assumptions, right? So it's uh, you know I'd never want to hear in this environment, well that because that's the way we've always done it, right? So I'd be looking at what, what are the things we've always done it this way and how might somebody else who knew nothing about your business come in and do it? I mean, you know, for, for instance, I know of a startup here in the area that's, uh, you know, uh, picking up cars and delivering them to dealers and, and uh, uh, you know, providing touch-free uh, uh, transactions. Uh, you know, uh, I've always wanted a dealer to take my car in and bring me a car. I don't want to deal with that. I don't want to drive to the dealer and, and do that. And so, you know, that's being re-examined. Uh, there's been a model that said that didn't work before, you know. Uh, you know, Tesla, uh, obviously, uh, when you buy a Tesla in Texas, because they, they, the de- they won't let Tesla have dealerships in Texas, uh, you go pick it up from someplace, and, and now they're just delivering it to your house. And a lot of people are finding out they'd rather that than going to the dealer. So, so a lot of the dealers are transmissioning there. And so it's just re-examining every piece of your business uh, is the customer's why still the same why that was successful when you started your business? Uh, you know, why have you been successful and is that still true today or what has maybe tweaked or changed on that? And, uh, you know, I think almost every business is impacted somewhat by this. Uh, I, I have yet to find, I, I keep hearing third order, fourth order, fifth order effects of this, uh, that, that surprised me. So I don't know if that answers it, but that, that would be my comments on it anyway. Yeah, and I'm real, I'm real proud of Doug and his team just speaking about innovation as an example, I think, for all of us today. And Joel, you'll relate to this. You know, Doug is in the auto care business, and one of the things they decided to do uh, here in Maryland specifically was to deliver groceries to customers. So, uh, you know. If, yeah, sure. <laughs> uh, for, I mean, what, a, what an interesting thing. So, you know, yes, we'll come pick up your car. Yes, we'll do all those things that we're doing right now and quite honestly Doug has been a forefront and in, in doing for many years but all of a sudden they say well hey you're if you're a customer we love you we we believe in our community and you can't get out we want to use our delivery service to come pick up your car normally but in this case we'll come and deliver groceries to you and what an innovative way to think and I think the question then so you know some of us have been creative or innovative at the time but the question that you're really referencing maybe as a question to our employees or our customers to say, hey, what did you see or what did you experience or what would you like us to continue to do as we go forward and making sure that, to back to your assumptions, maybe that's the most valuable thing in the future that they say, hey, I really love that my car place delivers my groceries to me. (laughs) Could be. Right? Could be, yes. I mean, we don't know. That's the point. And we ask that question and maybe we've got somebody on our team that just says, Hey, my, the enjoyment of my job, I love more than anything else, delivering something to the customer. And maybe in the future, it's not, maybe it's not groceries. Maybe we pick something up from the mailbox. I mean, we're thinking creatively and being outside the box, but the point to your point to to what you're saying is that trying to find those answers to what our customer really values and not just assuming that it was the same thing that it was three months ago is the smartest move for us in business. You have any other comment on that or any thoughts? Yeah, I appreciate that. Thank you. Thanks, Doug. Sure. I appreciate the question. Um, hey, Joe, let's talk a little bit about um, one of the things that I appreciate about you, what you talk about in the book and that you've embodied as a leader is the importance of good processes. And you mentioned that you're an engineer type and that you really look at that. I know that many businesses aren't prepared to sell or they're not even necessarily functioning at the highest level because they've never really thought through the critical processes in their organization. Can you tell us about what processes are critical and 
and what should be measured and and that, that really is part of what you do with your software packages as well yeah and, and certainly that could that could be a long conversation but but i'll tell you that you know i, I mentioned the employees customer shareholders triangle uh that's kind of the 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 external tension that the CEO manages. And then there's kind of an internal tension in most organizations that the CEO has to manage too, between sales, marketing, and whatever product or service you deliver. That's, those are just natural tendencies. And so when we start with companies, we say, okay, let's take those six areas, sales, marketing, product, customers, employees, shareholders, and every quarter, let's just think about what's one import, what's the one most important thing we can do in each of those areas. Mm. Because what I find in most businesses is if the person that runs the business had a sales background, they may come up with some goals and objectives, but 80% of them are going to be sales related. <laughs> or, or if they have a finance background, they're going to come up with some goals and objectives, but they're all going to be around a P&L statement or you know, and you see this in public companies, I sat on the board of a public company and I walked into the first board meeting and we were four hours in and I had only seen financial metrics. Right. And I said, hey guys, do we, you know, do we have any data on our customers? Do we have any data on our employees? Do we ever, oh, they're like, oh, our customers love us. Our employees are the best. Yeah, but how would you know? You've never even asked anybody. Mm -hmm. And so being balanced, you know, obviously the tightrope analogy, but being balanced across your business and making sure that you're thinking of each of those six important areas of the business every quarter, what are we doing in each of those areas? I think that's the first step because often I see businesses that are just entirely over to one side or the other. They're totally a sales culture. They're totally a, a finance penny pension culture. And to be really successful, you got to be good at all those areas, all six areas. And, and yeah. that's what it takes to be really successful. That's excellent. A uh, question that we got tied to your earlier thought about um, the idea of credibility and, and setting goals that um, we have control over. Somebody asked the question of where does stretch goals come in or how do you incur? I mean, it, should we be content only to be setting goals that we know we can reach or is there aspirational goals that we should set out there as well? Yeah, great question. And, and, and I, I, I've been doing running companies by goal setting for 20 years. So I think I know a little bit about this. Um, and, and so there's some subtlety to this. First of all, the reason I set goals is to deliver predictable performance. Okay. Mm -hmm. that, that's, if you ask me to summarize a CEO's job in, in kind of two words, it's predictable performance. A lot of people think performance, CEO is responsible for performance. Yes, they are. But if it's not predictable, you, you, you can't be successful. Mm -hmm. And so I, t I want people to set goals that are achievable. Now, when is a stretch goal make sense? Well, let me use a sports analogy, okay? If the team's on a 10-game winning streak, okay, it's very easy for the team to get complacent, right? Mm -hmm. So as the coach of that team, you're probably going to come into the locker room before the 11th game and say, hey, guys, let's go for a shutout today. Okay, because you got to get them motivated, right? They've won 10 in a row. It's very easy to get, you know. And so I talk about in the book, the, C, the concept of the CEO kind of being a shock absorber. When the team's up, you got to kind of get. So that's the way I use stretch goals. If, if things are going really well and the team's had a bunch of success and they're winning, then you might push them. And, and let's, we're going to set something here a little, you know, maybe this is over the top, guys, but I think we can do it. Makes sense. What you don't want to do is we've missed our goals for six quarters in a row and we're going to set another unattainable goal because what happens, you know, if we're 0 and 10 talking about, you know, the famous uh, uh, Jim, uh, what was his name? The co co coach of the new Orleans saints when they asked him about the playoffs and he was right. playoffs, playoffs. What are you talking about? Playoffs. Uh, you know, but that's what I see is a lot of CEOs come in and they set these unachievable goals quarter after quarter. The team doesn't hit them. They get discouraged everybody wants to win. And so you got to set goals in a way that people can win. Now, if you're winning all the time, yeah, then you ratchet up and, and get a little more aggressive with the goal set. Uh, I think that's excellent and a great insight as you think through, uh, you know, how to set goals for your team and, and how to say, even set goals for us as a leader. You know, we practice win walls at the CEO retreats that I lead and our team leads and you know, helping people to think through where are we winning, where do we need to focus, and then, you know, out of those winnings, just like you talk about, hey, we can really stretch something here. We can really push it a little bit further. I got another question um, that was sent to me around 
um, obviously people in their own departments can set goals, but as from an organizational standpoint, is the CEO primarily responsible for that or is that a team effort as well? Yeah, the way that actually works is I set up a meeting a couple of weeks before the beginning of every quarter with my exact team. I'll come into the meeting. Uh, I'll have those six areas, right? So I'll say, you know, for customers, I think the most important thing we can do is X. And for employees, the most important thing we can do is Y. And, and so I'll have some draft goal, set of goals um, to talk about. Uh, then after about an hour and a half of me beating them into submission, they agree with me. No, uh, <laughs> no, often they'll say, well, how are we going to measure that one? And we'll have a conversation and somebody will bring up something I haven't thought of. And, and, uh, you know, so, so it's, you know, the CEO should lead, uh, but you want the input of all the brains in the room about what's the right measurement, where should we set it? Uh, what are things maybe I'm not thinking about? And so you want that process occurring at every level of the organization. You want the leader of sales going into the sales team and saying, hey, here's kind of what I signed up us for at the corporate level, but how are we going to get there? Help me figure out, you know, what we need to do to get there. And, and so that collaborative process uh, is important and you want everybody to, to buy into their goals. I, you don't want somebody coming in and saying, you know, to an employee, okay, here are your five goals. Uh, no, that, that doesn't work. You want to say, here's the destination we're trying to get to as a team. How can you help me get there? What can you do as a member of this team to help me get there? And then facilitate that conversation and go back and forth. And, 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 and the measurement piece is, is really important. Their, their magic comes out of that, boy, when you ask, because the tendency is people want to put down the easiest thing to measure. But that's often not the right thing to measure and the most valuable thing to measure. And so I often push on people, they'll bring in a measurement and I'll go, why, why did you choose that measurement? What were some other measurements you should have, you know, we could have thought of? What are the other ways to measure this thing? And that conversation about the measurement, because till you, until you have agreement on the measurement, like I talked, told that story earlier, you don't really have a goal. You know, grow 40% sounded like a good goal, but until we defined it as bookings or revenue or profit or whatever, we didn't really have a goal. And so conversations about that, the measurement are, are really important to make being successful. Excellent. Hey, another question I got was around balance. I mean, you talked about these six areas being really critical for a balanced organization. And, and uh, the question is, or the comment was, they would agree that obviously every one of those areas are important, but is there a time where you can focus on one or, one or more of those areas to achieve success? Or does it have to be consistent focus on all six of those areas all the time? Well, I mean, some of that depends on size of the organization. Uh, you know, if I'm 10 or 15 people, I can only chase so many things at one time. And, and again, I may be effectively the VP of sales, the VP of marketing, the VP of product all at the same time. And so I can't, you know, chase a key initiative in every area. Uh, once you get to scale, I think, you know, 100 employees, 200 employees, and, and that point, uh, then you really do need to, to have some balance. It doesn't mean there isn't a, a driving initiative this quarter. Uh, there absolutely can be a particular issue that, you know, is try, we're going to launch a new product and we want everybody in the company focused around launching the new product. Um, but I, I find companies, it's so easy to get out of balance. Or, or the other thing that I see is you almost create two classes of employees. Mm. You, you'll, you'll have some project that's really important. And so you got the cool kids or the ones who are working on that project. And then everybody else is kind of taken for granted, mm. you know? And I, I remember I had an executive come up to me early in his time working with me. And he said, we need to have a, a weekly business meeting. And I went, okay, what, you know, I, th I thought we were having a weekly business meeting. Well, we don't need accounting and finance and HR and IT. We don't need those people in the meeting because they're not really part business, you know. And I was like, huh? I mean, <laughs> I, I wouldn't have them if they weren't important to running the business. But his view of the world was business was just sales and marketing because that was his expertise, right? <laughs> and so you really just, I, that, I cringe at, at, at that. And, and that's why I'm always focused on are we including everybody are we, are we rowing all parts of the ship at the same time? Hey, we got a couple more quick questions and we've only got a, a, a little less than 10 minutes with Joel left. So if you've got a question, either put it in the chat box or send it to me directly. 
another question, uh, Joel, that I received is how often should you meet with your leadership team to go over those goals? Is that, is that weekly? Is it monthly? Is it quarterly? Uh, what's your recommendation? Yeah, we do goal setting on a quarterly basis, and I've found that works just well for just almost every organization. A year's too long, uh, things get out of date, and, and a quarter works pretty well. And then, yes, we review them on a weekly basis. Uh, we ask, we, we don't look at data. Uh, we ask two simple, but we think more powerful questions than looking at data. We ask everybody, how likely are you to achieve your goal? So don't tell me you're 80% done, because if you tell me you're 80% done, you may just confuse me, right? Because if you tell me you're 80% done, I might say, well, I guess he's, he's going to get there. We're not very far in the quarter. Uh, but you may have hit a blocker, and you may know you have nothing left, right? Uh, you could be 20% done and know exactly how you're going to knock out the last 80%. So I learned that uh, executives like to confuse you with data. Uh, and instead leave the data to them and just say, how likely are you going to get to the goal? That's all I care about and make them and hold them accountable for delivering that result. And then the other question we ask them on each of their goals each week is how do you feel about the quality of the work done so far? Mm. And so this is a way for anybody in the organization to raise a red flag and say, hey, I've got a problem. So maybe a sales guy says, I'm going to hit my number, but I've drained my pipeline. I've got nothing for next quarter. So I'm worried, boss. Or in my software development world, maybe a developer says, hey, we're going to ship the product, but let me tell you, it's held together with duct tape and bailing wire and support better be ready, <laughs> you know. And so it, when you look at organizations that fail, inevitably there were people down in the organization who knew what was going on, who knew there were problems, but had no way to communicate that up to the top of the organization. And so we ask those questions religiously every week of every person in the organization to give them a way to say, hey, we got a problem. I like those questions, boy. Those are great ideas as well. Are you gonna hit your goal? And how do you feel about the quality of work that you're doing? I think those are fantastic. Wow, what great questions, Joel, excellent. Hey, I had another quick question. Um, speaking about balance, um, I got the question of obviously balance in the organization is important. Help, having good team members help with the CEO's balance, but sometimes how do you shut it off when you have a growing organization? And I think they mean, you know, sometimes as a business owner, the larger the organization or the bigger it becomes, uh, the more problems that we have. And I think leaders have a time of, of shutting it off. I'll say real quick, I, I remember I had a mentor years ago when I had my first child and she told me, hey Ken, uh, you know, you, you're going to have a learning experience when you have this baby, but just know the bigger the baby becomes, the bigger the problems, right? And uh, <laughs> I've remembered that where it came to business at times as well, right? So businesses are a lot like babies. You know, when we start out, that's kind of the hardest part, but the bigger they become, it just means that we have bigger problems. So how do you shut that off or what best advice do you give to how do you, how do you separate from the business from time to time? Yeah, and you know, your people talk about work-life separation. I've never thought that was a particularly valuable term as a CEO. I, I think it's work-life integration is the way I, I think of it. Um, but I think if you're if you're doing the job correctly, again, when you get to scale. Now, if you're ten people, you know, you got to jump in the middle of all kinds of problems and grab a wrench sometimes and and, and do things. But when you get to scale, if you're doing the job right you're spending 90, 80, 90% 90 of your time managing the future mm. as opposed to dealing with problems. If you just walk into your office as CEO and allow people to dump problems on your desk, <laughs> uh, you will be infinitely busy, but you won't accomplish very much. Uh, and so again, with that concept of managing experts, uh, what, what it really should look like is you should be spending 80% of your time anticipating what next quarter and two quarters and, and a year from now is going to look like, setting, being very clear with the vision, and then getting out of people's way <laughs> and letting them deliver the, the results. And, uh, you know, if you don't have the right people, that's a different conversation. But too many leaders feel like uh, they're not doing anything and, and they want to be the firefighter. They want to be the hero. They want to come in and solve all the problems. And, and that's just not the role of the CEO at scale. Excellent. And it, it, it's not, it'll, it'll drive you crazy. Absolutely. Right. Yeah, that was excellent uh, advice. I did put a link to your book in the chat for, for anybody who'd like to get on and, and get that book. I do highly recommend it. It's a fantastic uh, read and very practical. Joel just walks through his own story, but also the lessons that he's learned in leadership. 
And Joe, I think you're a fantastic leader. I'm a, I'm a great fan. I'm a great fan of your book, but I'm even a, a greater fan of you as a leader. Hey, um, real quick, just the last couple of minutes, uh, you and I started, we talked about the virus and we've talked even a little bit about it. Uh, where's your head been and what have you been, as you think about God and the sovereignty, of, let's, let's talk personal for a second. Has, has God revealed anything to you or have you been focused on one of his attributes or characteristics during this time or what's given you inspiration and encouragement? Yeah, so, you know, I think as a believer, um, you know, I was not, I mean, I, I don't get terribly stressed about the situation personally. I think I actually had the virus uh, for a period of time. I had a couple of weeks where I was low grade headache and, and kind of tired all the time. And, and, you know, it, it, I, I'm, I'm certainly pretty philosophical. If this is my time, it's my time uh, from that, from that perspective. I have, uh, you know, my prayer lately has been all about how can I, you know, make a difference because, uh, you know, I've felt a little bit of a, fire hose on a forest fire situation, uh, you know, because uh, not only businesses have been impacted by this, I mean, a non numerous nonprofits that I, I know and associated with have had, you know, major issues because of this that, uh, you know, they couldn't have foreseen, uh, you know, there's just no way to, to know that they weren't, you know, one I'm associated with that's uh, for, uh, uh, disabled uh, adults uh, gives them a place to live independently. Uh, they built a business around growing flowers, selling flowers. So, you know, spring season was big for them. They sell lilies to all the churches for Easter service. Uh, you know, that's a hundred thousand. They have a summer camp. That's another hundred that suddenly they were looking at going from hundreds of thousands of dollars of revenue to zero, uh, pretty much overnight. And, uh, they had a reserve fund. They had managed their money well, but you can't go from hundreds of thousands to zero for most organizations. Yeah. And so, you know, I've been focused on where can I make a difference? Uh, where are the opportunities? Uh, because, you know, you can't just throw money at this one. Even, I think even the federal government's going to find out that there is a limit to infinite amount of money. <laughs> uh, it, it doesn't solve the problem. It, it, people aren't, the, the transactions, what's important. People trading is the, is the important thing, getting what they want and just throwing money at that doesn't, doesn't really solve the needs of the community. And so that, you know, I'm certainly looking for ways to make a difference in the community uh, as we put this back together in a new and hopefully better way. Excellent. Yeah, I, I appreciate that spirit. And I've seen that in um, articles that you've released and information that you shared. I mean, you uh, add such great value to whatever audience that, that you're in. And, and I just uh, appreciate, like I said, I appreciate your knowledge, your wisdom, your insight. You've done a great job of growing companies, scaling them, um, moving on to the next thing that God had in store for you. And I'm excited. Um, you, uh, you impress me all the time with your uh, great uh, breadth of leadership. Uh, Jill is also not only the author of um, the CEO Tightrope, but now he's also the publisher of Texas CEO Magazine that's going all throughout uh, Texas for CEOs and business leaders. Uh, so he's got his finger on the pulse of a leadership and business. And I think, you know, my encouragement, one of the reasons I wanted Joel to come on and be with us today is, you know, uh, I think Jesus uh, reminds us that we should respect our government, respect the government leaders. I do find it interesting in Jesus's ministry, he never really had much of a conversation about um, what was happening in the government other than you know, we ought to pay our taxes, right? Uh, <laughs> right. <laughs> but, but he had a nobler purpose. He had a bigger vision of what he was trying to accomplish. And, yeah. you know, it wasn't the government that at time changed the world. It was really Jesus and this group of disciples that changed the world. And I think at this time, I mean, my encouragement, and I think Joel's really tied into it, is I, I think Christian leaders, I think well-done leaders, as I would put that phraseology, we understand um, what's what's valuable at the moment. We understand the order of things. We understand listening to our customer's voice and understanding how to be good stewards, which means questioning things and saying, hey, what we knew yesterday may not be the same as today. And as a steward, let's pivot to, to focus on those things. So Joel, I just appreciate your leadership. And of course, I appreciate your friendship. So thanks for being here today. God bless. All right. Thank you guys for tuning in today. We'll have another CEO conversation and we hope to see you at our next conversation uh, in the next few, few days. So thank you for attending today.